Hey everybody, welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And today we have a, a very special guest, a very good friend of the channel, uh, somebody I look up to in this field, and that is our friend Grant Cameron. Welcome, Grant. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It's a uh, hot time in ufology, and uh, uh, we'll uncover some stuff maybe today that uh, you've got some stuff I haven't got, and I've got some stuff that maybe you haven't heard. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, let me let me just start off by saying you have you have two new books coming out, but um, one one of them is uh, Beyond Managing Magic, and uh, the sub subtitle there is the Compendium of Rumors. So, super brief uh, for for let's say newcomers or people who may not be familiar, just even managing magic. What can you concisely um, unpack? Uh, what what was managing magic? Your the first book. Okay, well, I've done, I guess it's now four books or five books on the disclosure thing. And I've, I'm have i one of the people that's always maintained that they're disclosing. They're gradually disclosing. They're doing this uh, this whole deal that they talked about at the Seoul uh, conference, this controlled disclosure. As you slowly let it out. And then 2017 comes along and they say, oh, yeah, we're doing UFOs. And everybody goes, yeah, I knew that already. No, nobody jumps off a building. Stock market doesn't melt down. Nothing like that happens. So managing magic is is goes back to the idea that everybody gets into their own little, it's almost like stove piping in uh, classified material or in academia. I was in academia for 40 years. And I know that if you're a, a phys, if you're a chemist, you don't go in the biology building. You, you, you never go in there. And you don't go in the engineering building. Everybody's in their own little niche. And so the whole idea is everybody's doing their own little thing. And what uh, managing magic is, is the idea that this thing is more than UFOs. It's magic. It's the whole spectrum. In fact, Ron Pandolfi, who you and I have talked about a number of times, this is what he said, 1991, when he first started and he talked to Dan Smith, what he said to Dan is, we have a phenomenology problem. And that's what it's referred to as the phenomenology. So it's like magic. So they're not just trying to uh, figure out UFOs, they're trying to figure out this whole spectrum of paranormal phenomena, because they know it's all related and it's managing things. So how do we control this? How do we develop it and this sort of thing? And uh, so I put that out and it, it was the, the idea of uh, disclosing stuff. So this was written in 2017. And that's when I first sort of announced that uh, there was gonna be disclosure, that Hillary Clinton had uh, made the term, said there's a new nomenclature, it's called UAPs, not called UFOs anymore. And then they have the meeting with uh, Lockheed Skunk Works and, and the, the generals at, and with John, with John Podesta, and they're going to drop it. Hillary loses the election. And it was supposed to run. I've actually confirmed it again with Chris. It was supposed to run from 2017 to 2025. That was when the disclosure was going to take place over this eight-year period. So what have you got in the latest rendition? Oh, we're going to disclose it between 2024 and 2030. It's the same story. In fact, you get the same story going back where... In, in 1995, John Podesta helped Bill Clinton get an ex executive order to get the UFO material out. And what it was, was anything over 25 years has to be disclosed, any document over 25 years. And they were thought they could get the UFO stuff out by that. And what happened was they, a billion pages got dis disclosed, but it, none of it was UFO material. Same thing now, they got the same thing, the 25-year rule. Anything after 25 years, you, unless the president uh, exempts it, it has to be disclosed. And so you see these these patterns that that the government has all along the Disney in the 1950s. Uh, there was uh, Blue Book people in the movie UFO Unidentified Flying Object 1956. There were consultants to that movie. Uh, I've told the story numerous times about my friend Bob Emenegger being approached twice, signing an actual contract with the Pentagon to do a thing. And they give him these these uh, stories about uh, contact, the channeling of the alien at the at the CIA building. And the landing at the Holloman Air Force Base, uh, which seems now pretty clear that this is a real story. And uh, so this is the whole idea. How do you manage the story? How do you uh, how do you leak it out? How do you uh, find out what's going on? So that was managing magic. And then um, uh, I, I got into there was so much material. Then I started with the beyond managing magic. So the second one, the compendium of rumors and the, 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 the where that came from is John Alexander, where John Alexander said it's all rumor. And yeah, it's all rumor, sure, because you know nobody's really telling you any stories, and uh, I I get it, and sure I'll admit you that that it may not all be 100 true. A lot of it's turned out to be true, and so you call it the compendium of rumors. So that's why I called the 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 next book Beyond Managing Magic. It's the next thing, and in, the second book is pretty dry. It goes into uh, 
um, the whole thing about OSAP and ATIP and how it formed and stuff. And I guess the most important story in that book is the whole Tom DeLong book, which Tom DeLong story, which I have totally told people, you, you haven't got a clue what happened here. You keep messing the story up. Even Tom, the way he tells it, I don't think is is the way it happened. And that is the idea that Tom built this group and he, he saved ufology and all sorts of stuff. And no, it's not how it happened. He got a phone call from Lockheed Skunk Works, from a guy inside Lockheed and said, hey, how would you like to introduce the president at a barbecue that we're having in the parking lot? And they knew he was into UFOs. He ran this strange time uh, conspiracy website where he had all sorts of like National Enquirer type stories on the internet night 2012. They knew he was into all this stuff and they invite him there. And then he's, they say, uh, he wants five minutes. They take him into the skiff and he gets in a, a Lockheed skiff, a, a civilian guy. And he's talking to the head scientist who says, what, you know, when he starts talking about consciousness, the head scientist, all he wants to talk about is for 45 minutes is consciousness. And then they send him to Washington to this. The one guy from the skiff is there and there's an intelligence guy. And that's when they say to him, the, they say, hey, stuff like this does not happen at the White House. It does not happen in Congress. It happens when guys like this take the ball and move it down the field. And then he gets sent to, Na to NASA and then he gets sent to Ames. Then he gets sent to the general and they set this whole thing up for him. Now, he did a lot of work putting all this stuff together and talking to these people. But basically, they fed him the same as they fed Bill Moore. I said, it's exactly the same story. Bill Moore had 24 people and 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 uh, they were feeding Bob Emenegger and they were feeding Walt Disney and they were feeding this kind of stuff. And that's how they do it. They use a fictional account to put it out. So that's the second book. It sort of goes through. And then the third book is sort of on the stuff that's um, going on now, the whole, you know, uh, the, the the disclosure and the Congress and what's going on inside Congress. And uh, I'm not even sure I'm going to release the books because it's so controversial in terms of people fighting and stuff like that. Um, I've sort of held it back. I've got actually got three books that I finished that are edited that I, uh, uh, I have held back. And I'm basically off to writing the next book. <laughs> I'm writing this book called Crossover, which I'm really excited about, uh, which links all the paranormal phenomena and shows uh, what actually may be going on and who's behind this thing. So I actually, I, I do want to get to that conversation. Um, but uh, just briefly, uh, Holloman Air Force Base incident. Yeah. Uh, do you want to briefly outline that? And then it's connection to Emanager with him. Uh, you know, he was supposed to get a piece of the film to put in the documentary. Cause I, I think that's uh, an important topic to, to just discuss really quick. Yeah, that, that, well, that's the story that Bob told me. And Bob, to to uh, clarify for people, Bob had no interest in UFOs. And I was in, I was stayed at his house a couple of times. I knew him better probably than anybody. And um, it, his wife, he never read books. He would sit there and read. He would sit there and watch the Comedy Channel. He was big into comedy. And uh, his wife would say, "Bob, what do you what do you know? You don't know nothing. You've never read a book." And he goes, and he put his head down and go, "Yeah, you're right." And, what happened was he got called to Norton Air Force Base in about 1973. He was close friends with the communication director for for uh, Richard Nixon's administration, and he was uh, knew Bob Holloman, the, the chief of staff for Nixon, very well. He was one step ahead. They both went to UCLA, and uh, so he gets he gets called with uh, his his partner, who is Alan Sandler. And Alan Sandler has a studio and Bob's a, an executive for gray advertising and they're running this studio and they're doing, uh, you know, documentaries and stuff. And one of the key parts that, that, that people didn't know is that Annie Spielberg, who was Steven Spielberg's sister worked for them. She was a line producer for them. So they have this studio and they're doing documentaries on various, various things for the military. And they get called into Norton air force base. And that's when uh, they say, Oh, we want you to, this is the Vietnam war. It's, if we get we're bad in the public, we want you to do some stuff that's going to, you know, put a good light on the military. We want you to do 3D holography and working with dolphins and, and gave them all these stories. And they said, yeah, OK, you know, we'll work on that. And uh, they this is all under contract. They actually signed contracts for this. And then that's when Paul Chartle, who's the security manager at Norton Air Force Base, said, oh, and we'd also like you to do this thing on UFOs, but we'd like you to hide it under the other documentaries. And that's when Bob said, what do you mean? What do you mean? You mean uh, the, the, my wife was right? I used to bug her about Mar. Uh, uh, I can't remember her name escapes me, but uh, quit quit reading that stuff about the alien had my baby. And he's and suddenly he's confronted with this thing like this is for real. And that's when Paul Chartle said, "What would you say if I told you that there had been a landing at Hollow Air Force Base and that it had been filmed?" And the, so the story was Bob had a lot of details, which you you won't hear until you hear Bob. 
Uh, the details were at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, there was four different cameras going. One was in a helicopter. They knew this was coming in. Um, and that Bob actually was on the site. He actually got permission through the Pentagon to go to Holloman Air Force Base and see the hangar where they supposedly kept this craft. And uh, Paul Charlotte was the guy that saw the film. And they said, well, we'll give you this film for the documentary. And um, they had the film in their possession. Bob always claimed he didn't see it or he saw uh, picture board stuff off the film. Uh, Paul Shardle described it very clearly what, what he saw in the film. And this is this whole story of this UFO. There's three UFOs come in and uh, one, one uh, lands, the other two take off and the door opens up and these aliens come out and they're greeted by officials, uh, Holloman Air Force Base officials. And uh, they, they put this uh, craft in a hangar and uh, Bob has the, the film of this thing coming in. And so um, they, they have the film. And then at the very end, uh, the guy who was in charge of it was Robert Coleman. He was the PR guy for Project Blue Book at the Pentagon, says to them, uh, we have to pull the film. It, it's the Vietnam War. It's bad. We can't pull the film. And they pull the film. And then they say, you're going to have to storyboard it. So they tell the story. Hypothetically, this might happen in the future. And they go through this thing about, oh, this UFO may land and all this sort of stuff. And they put it, put it like that. And then there's this eight seconds of film of this and you can tell it changes it's like they're making this thing where they you can hear the the radar guy talking and we got this thing coming out identify yourself and also and then there's this cut you can definitely see there's a cut off it and suddenly there's this object coming in over the hills of like a light in the sky seen. yeah and and um so uh, what the rumor was going around that there was eight seconds that bob had been allowed to put it in the film and i saw so he told the story that when it got taken back there was heavy set couple that it went in a small little tiny datsun and they drove from L.A. with the film back to the Pentagon with this film. And so I said, I thought you, you said the film went back to the Pentagon. He said, well, it did. And he told me the whole story about these two people in the dats. And I said, well, I know that story. Yeah. But, Bob, there's eight seconds of film in the, in the, in the documentary. And he goes, oh, well, uh, he said, didn't show anything. I said, what do you mean it didn't show anything? Oh, he said it was just background. I said, background? What are you talking about as background? And he said, well, it didn't show anything. And then, and then I said, but there's eight seconds in the film, Bob. And then he said, well, they allowed us to use that because it wasn't classified. It didn't show the, the body, the, the aliens coming out. You can see it. It's like a, a light coming over the hill yeah. and it's a daylight shot and it's coming over the hill. So it's far enough away that you can't really identify what it is and you don't see the body. And so the name, that, it's, it's UFOs Past, Present, Future? Is that, the, that was the name of, the, of the, uh, the, book. the book. Bob wrote the book and the documentary was called that. And then in 1979, the one that's on the internet, uh, you can find the whole documentary. Uh, it was redone. Jacques Vallée came and they added capital relations and stuff like that to it. And it was called UFOs that has begun. So you can find right, that yeah. the entire documentary. And so they put this eight seconds of, of film in there. And um, that, that's when I said to Bob, I said, hey, Bob. And, and everybody's contacting me. I, at the time, I was in contact with the NIDS guys or yeah. with basically Eric Davis, because he was the, the chief scientist and he just got laid off. And I met with him and we talked and he was pretty open about what was going on and stuff like that. And so they were they were trying to they were talking to me about the the film and what had Bob told me and they were going to bring in Paul Shardle to NIDS in uh, whatever this was night two thousand and two two thousand and three or something and he dies in a rollover car accident so he's the only guy that saw the film so I said to Bob I said Bob you know the weirdest thing was you know if it weren't for the time of day and if it weren't for the uh, location this is close encounters of the third kind he said what I didn't tell you I said no you didn't tell me what. So I didn't tell you I gave a copy to Steven Spielberg. I said, no, you didn't tell me that. He said, yeah, Andy Spielberg in 1975 wanted a copy of the documentary for Steven. And then so he gave him in 1977 Close Encounters. And that's what Close Encounters is. They're waiting for the craft. There's three crafts come in, two fly away, one lands. It's all planned. It's all being filmed. That's the story. And, 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 and then he said that Steven Spielberg's mother had come to him. And she said, Bob, I've seen your version of the landing and I've seen Steven's version. And I like Steven's version better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then now there's stuff. If you've seen uh, Giuliano, he's he's he logs all this stuff. And yeah. there's a lot of stuff to back this up that this was true. I mean, in fact, there's the story when help when Jacques Vallée put the story out. I had been talking at that time to Hal and to mo mostly to Eric Davis, but at that time there was a sworn secret that I had that uh, Eric Davis had phoned me up and asked for um, the phone phone number for President. Uh, Clinton, uh, Carter, because I'm the president guy. And I go, I, I'm a Canadian. I don't have his phone number. And then yeah. he tells his story about talking to 
two presidents about UFOs. Now, Jacques Vallée released the one in his book. And I said, OK, now it's all out in the open. So now I can talk about this. And this was the whole deal that Eric Davis actually went to Bush and to Ford. And he asked him about this, like the, 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 the film. Did you see it? Because there's a rumored story with Carter that Carter had a Secret Service agent who was in the briefing and uh, it, when Carter was there and that he came out and said there was a 15 minute color film that was shown to, to Jimmy Carter. And I'm thinking, wow, that's the, the, the whole thing was, was this the Holman film? Is the president shown this film in his presidential briefing? So that's what Eric was asking uh, uh, Ford. He asked Ford, did you see the, the film? And Ford said, yeah, I saw the film. And he said, well, when was the briefing? He said, I'm never gonna tell you when the briefing is. Don't even go there. And then he went to, to Bush and Bush was much more open about the thing. And that's when he asked the question, he said, did you see it? He said, I didn't see it as president, president elect when I got my briefing, uh, but I saw it as CI director. And then Eric starts asking the questions. Well, was it a psychological? Because all these things that Bill Coleman was putting out. Oh, we had these lenses. We wanted to protect the lenses we were shooting with. They were classified. Uh, it was a psychological operation. It was a flame out of an A-12. And Coleman had all these things. In fact, Bob told me one time, he said, he said uh, Coleman says to me, so okay, I'll give you 20 questions. If you can get it, I'll, I'll answer it. 20 questions and, and why why the film was 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 pulled. And see, so he gets the, the final 20 questions and, and he still hasn't got anything. And then uh, Coleman says to Bobby, says, I could tell you, you know, I could I could tell you the, the truth. I could take you out into the Gulf of New Mexico and I could tell you the actual truth. But then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> so, yeah. so Bob tells this 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 story that, you know, that that uh, they had they 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 had this. Uh, but it had all these excuses. So that's what Eric Davis was asking Bush. Was it a flame out of an A-12? Was it a psychological operation? Was it a training film? Was it this? And he said, no, 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 it wasn't that. It was the real deal and the classification. I think according to Valet, was very, very strict. He didn't tell me that part, but Valet makes that part. So that's the whole deal is, is these guys were chasing it. And, and people, uh, I think, sort of always get this thing about us versus them. There's the good guys and the bad guys. We're the good guys. And and back then, the NIDs were the bad guys. They were like the Avery. Oh, these guys are covering this stuff up. And Bob Bigelow is this uh, guy who never has his picture taken. And it's all, you know, this sort of stuff. They were not. They're just like you and I. They just had contacts. So Bob Bigelow would call these people into NIDs. And he was paying, like, I won't say what he paid, but he was paying big money to bring in Kit Green. And, and they would have six meetings a year. For, and they would bring them in and they would have these meetings and it's like you get your top guys that know about ufos bring them to your place for the weekend and sit there and chat and you learn a lot of stuff because kit green knows some stuff jacques Allais knows some stuff and and that's what all bigelow is doing is he's picking the brains of the of the people that would make sense he's got the money and he's trying to figure out what it is so they they had this whole thing where uh they were trying to figure out like the triangles and they were after the holman air force base they were that's the thing they were trying to figure out is the holman air force base story real because Hal had gone after it at one point, and and there was a story that Senator Dodd had asked uh, had an FOIA after the documentary was shown. Uh, he was under pressure, and he filed an FOIA for the for the film, and he was told he was he was told it was in a Navy sink. And I remember Hal was trying to figure out where's the film, uh, who's got the film, and then you discover other things like uh, that stories that people really missed. And I asked Bob, I said, hey. So you had to give back the Holman film, right? He said, yeah. And I said, you told me that you got stuff from NASA, from everybody. You, all sorts of stuff is coming to you. He said, yeah, I, we, we could get anything we wanted. We walked in the Pentagon. We didn't even sign into the Pentagon. We could get whatever we want. We could talk to whoever we wanted. There's no cover up. And then I said, well, what about what about some other films? And, and then he, he told this one about uh, the, uh, the, the launch from Vandenberg where the UFO comes yeah. and shoots the, into the rocket and it tumbles into the Pacific. He told me that story. And he said it was analyzed by this guy that did the blue book stuff. And he was an uh, expert. And he said it was one in a million chance that is anything but a UFO taking down a, a missile. And I said, what about that film? I said, do you hand that one back? And he said, no, I don't think we hand that one back. I said, what? You still got the film? And he said, well, I don't have it. I think Alan's got it. He's got it in the vault in Oregon. And so it's like, holy cow, he's still got this top seat. He said, yeah, it had Quentin Ellis' name on it. It's that top secret on the canister. And, 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 uh, and, and Sandler has it. So then I talked to, to uh, Angela Joyner back then. She was broke the Stevensville, Texas story. I said, hey, Angela, yeah. we're working on a book on the presence. I said, Angela, they got the film. They got this film. Alan Sandler's got it. Can, can, let's see if we can get this film. We've, we've got the exclusive here. We know we're the only ones that know they got this film. So then he, she made some contacts and Alan said that he would show it to, to Angela Joyner 
if he if she flew to Oregon to to see him. But he was he was sort of rumored as a, a womanizer, and she was afraid to go by herself. Yeah. So then she told James Fox, and then James Fox found out about it, and then James Fox went to Sandler to get the film. And I heard a rumor; I don't know if it was true that Sandler wanted twenty five thousand dollars just to view the film. That that and and so I don't know what happened with James; he didn't have the money to get the the film or whatever. But you had these these bizarre stories that indicated, yeah, there was behind the scenes, there was this stuff going on. And that guys like the people inside NIDS and the guys inside the Avery knew what was going on. And that's why I said, I don't care if you don't like Pendolfi or any of the Avery guys or the NIDS guys. Listen very carefully. When they talk from time to time, they're going to let something slip out that you didn't know. These guys know an awful lot more than you and I do. Yeah. And, you know, James Fox did mention Sandler to me in, in, um, in a conversation we had in regards to film as well. So I don't know. I don't think he ever obtained it but i you oh, know he didn't, he didn't get it he would have put it in the movie that was the thing he had he had big money that he had gotten for that movie and uh that was one of the things that that he was trying to trying to get and i don't know if sandler's still alive i think giuliano talked to him or somebody talked to him recently but he did all these guys are getting on like bob was uh he was pretty old when he died and now is the the idea of uh whether that stuff is gone because bob had a letter from nixon that was the whole story about uh this planned disclosure thing that Linda Howe um, had gone to Bob Ammenegger's home in Los Angeles. He had a big house, probably worth about $30 million now is the big house he lived in, in Los Angeles. She went there with another researcher, Sparks. Um, can't remember the guy's name, but anyway, they were there and Bob showed her a letter from Nixon and it had Nixon's signature on it and said, thank you for your discretion on the project we worked on. And he said, this is for the film. That the president's thanking me for working on this thing that it was planned by the president the president yeah. wanted this thing out and uh then when when we confronted him later on uh linda would say to him we were i remember it was, it was very uncomfortable and linda got really upset at me because she thought i was going after her but we were at a meeting it was at a conference or something it was like a dinner we were sitting there me and linda and bob and his wife and and she says come on bob own up admit it you showed me that letter, Bob. But, you know, and I started laughing and I left the room. And Linda was upset. She figured like I was laughing at her. And I said, no, I was just laughing at Bob because Bob had his head down. <laughs> he's like, he's not really answering the question. Well, I mean, and why, why did that he did have this letter? Yeah. I mean, why do you think Bob was so quiet about it? Well, it was the confidence. It was a confidence. It was a private letter from the president of the United States. And and I guess it was that your your discretion. And people all all swear secrecy to you know friends or whatever you know people do that all the time to me they say hey uh tell me something and then they say don't tell anybody and i go you're supposed to tell me that before you tell me what you're going to tell me because then i'd say don't tell me i'll tell everybody <laughs> it's like you know and, that, and people have these things where and so his he had one daughter in la and and that's sort of one of the things i'm going to actually have to work on is his daughter would still be alive and uh did the files uh get there because he had said he had a contract for this film I mean, and then he would talk about 83 when they had the second one, when they came back and they wanted Jacques Vallée and they wanted and uh, Alan, uh, J. Allen Hynek involved. And uh, the, the general, General Miller, Glenn Miller, who was the first uh, uh, agent for Ronald Reagan in Hollywood, said, uh, we're, we're going to get this, uh, release the film, give all the film to Hynek. And then Paul Chartle said, sorry, General, you, you need a requisition for this. Uh, I can't just give him the film. God damn, I'll have your ass. You give him the film. And, and what had happened, according to Bob, was they came to him and said, Paul Shardle said, oh, they liked what you did in the 1970s. They'd like you to do it again. They'd like you to do another documentary. And this time, because he, I think because he had the Nixon letter, he said, so uh, who's this? Uh, is this Ronald Reagan? <laughs> it's like, who, where's this coming from? And uh, because Jacques Vallée called it the dangling carrot, he said, oh, we're not getting him because he knew what happened to the Holloman Air Force Base the first time. And he knew that they would get involved and they could lose their reputations. They'd get in, involved in this project. And then at the last minute, they pull all the evidence and Heineck and Ballet would look stupid. So they said, no, we're not getting involved. And they said, if they're not involved, the project's off. So this one in 83 was called off, but they were going to do it again. They were going to do another drop of, of material. And they did it in 88. I maintain the 1988 thing. And I talk about it in Beyond Magic Magic. The 1988s, everybody said, oh, it was a terrible documentary. It was called UFOs. Uh, UFO cover up live, live and yeah. it was all all read from scripts. It had this bizarre music in the back. And, and the it was aviary, all planned. Yeah. It was the last days of the Reagan administration, just before it was days before he left the office. And it was like, and this is my gift to the world on UFOs. And they leaked a whole bunch of the live alien story, the story of the Avery, that all that came out of that. And they had the Area 51 on the flow chart, right? 
Yeah, it, the, the Air 51 Plus, they had what was the other flow chart. They had, uh, they had another thing that was even bigger than Area 51. I can't remember. Um, if you, I would have looked it up if I'd known, but they had another thing that nobody knew about that was on that flow chart. And that was the whole thing. So the flow chart may have been not exactly the same, the right flow chart. That's what I always maintained is, is if you want a document released, all you got to do is change one word in the document. And then you've got plausible liability. It's a phony document. It's a phony, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a phony document. But it, it's got the material. And that's what they were doing. And, and uh, even in the 1990s, when they were releasing the the uh, New Majestic 12 documents, which everybody ignores. They say, oh, it's uh, garbage, you know. Is, and then you go and you say, well, it's Richard Doty did that. And I go, give your head a shake. Richard Doty, there was 35, uh, 3,700 pages of documents. People don't yeah. realize there was that many. And I remember the one that Ryan Wood showed me. And that was the one where he said, oh, look at this. I, my, my father, uh, no, it was Cooper, who was the guy who was leaking most of the documents. Tim Cooper, Cooper's yeah. father got a citation from Arthur Lundahl at the National Photographic Interpretation Center. And I said, what? Because I knew the story of the whole, that, that was where they channeled the alien in 1959, the National Photographic Interpretation Center. And Arthur Lundahl was the was the first guy that ran the weird desk. And then it was taken over by Kit Green. Then it was taken off over by Ron Pandolfi. He was the key guy on UFOs inside the, the CIA. And so when I saw that they had the National Photographic Interpretation Center uh, document him getting a citation that he'd worked for Lundahl, I said, this has got to be for real. But the thing was with the, with the, uh, the, the citation was given out by Curtis LeMay, but they'd spent, they'd misspelled Curtis LeMay's off and name. So everybody goes, ah, it's a hoax document. But when I saw the, the the thing, it's like there's no way they're just dropping these hints. But it's plausible liability. You you can yeah. walk away from these kind of documents. And I had I had uh, Ryan Wood on earlier this week. He's yeah. uh, re-releasing uh, Magic Eyes Only, the Crash Retrieval book, which I'm looking forward to. But he even said um, that Curtis LeMay thing that uh, Curtis LeMay had had spelt his name two different ways, and you can spell it two different ways. You know, for as far as you know, as Ryan Wood's argument is on that. Um, yeah, but I think where I would disagree with Ryan is they're always trying to insist that these are real documents. Right. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'm saying, no, they're not. The, the reason they make the little spelling error or whatever is to give it plausible liability that they. Yeah. they so you can release really it. And then, and then that's what I said with, with the Holloman, Holloman Air Force Base story. So they do the same thing. So I, it was May of 1971. Bob told me it was May of 1971. And I said, he knew that the CIA agent guy's name on, on the thing. He had a CIA guy on the set the whole time they were filming. Bob had all the inside contacts. He was dealing with the people. And so he said, May 1971. And then Richard Doty said, no, no, no. It was uh, 1964 at, at White Sands and the aliens got lost. I'm going, oh, come on. And and then Linda took that story. So Linda started right. saying it was 1964. So you got me saying 1971, Linda saying 1964. And that's what happens. We start fighting. And it's like, oh, you're wrong. I'm right. And and that's what they do is they, they, they put it into this, uh, even Chase Brandon, who wrote the book in 2012, Christos Conundrum. The book about how the CIA dealt with the CIA with the Roswell crash. That's what he said. He said, if you want to, he put it in fiction. It was reviewed eight times. He said, if you want a good re read, read the book. If you want to learn something, read between the lines. And Kit Green said the same thing. Read between the lines. It's the whole idea is you put it out. It's plausible liability. You can't, nobody can come back. Nobody's going to break security clearances, whatever. But you got to get that story out. You can't allow that story as they call this, where they call it cat catastrophic disclosure, where suddenly it gets dropped and, and suddenly it gets confirmed or something happens, you can't control it. You want to control that disclosure. So in 2017, when it becomes known, and, and they leaked that story too. That, that was uh, Jim Semivan that he told the whole story. Now, I was told in 2016 that Jim Semivan, he was called the big man at the time. He's going to go on 60 Minutes. He's, he's, he said high level people are going to come forward and they're going to say UFOs exist. And they're going to force disclosure. That's exactly what happened. It just took longer because Hillary lost the election. So a lot of that stuff uh, was confirmed. And do you think do you think the Holloman incident has anything to do with, uh, you know, David Grush's testimony where he's talking about agreements? Well, that's the whole thing is is the agreements because you got to remember that the two items that were leaked to Bob Emenager where not only the Holloman Air Force, which is a communication thing, they got communication, they're actually dealing with aliens, is the 1959 thing at the uh, uh, National Photographic Interpretation Center, where they've got this woman who's channeling in Elliott, Maine, 
and there's this Navy intelligence guy and a CIA guy go visit her and they're, they're, they're watching what she's channeling and stuff like that. They're all interested. They see her in 54 and then in 59, they go back again. And then she says to the one guy, why don't I just teach you how to do it? She puts her hand on his right shoulder and all of a sudden he's, oh, he's channeling this alien or whatever. And then he goes back to the National Photographic Interpretation Center and Arthur Lundahl says, oh, you, you, you're channeling aliens? Sit down, let's talk to the alien. Now, he, he's completely open-minded. And they do that whole thing. That was the second story that they leaked into that documentary. So it was two communication stories, Paul Air First Base and the, the channeling of the alien in 1959. And, and I remember Bob saying he went to Arthur Lundahl, was giving him the story. And he said to Art Lundahl, he said, well, can you narrate it? Can you narrate the, the channeling of APA? At the, and he said, no, I can't do it. He said, well, why not? He said, I'm on duty. And he said, what do you mean? I'm on duty. I'm on duty. I'm working. I can't, I can't go on camera. That's why they had Bob Friend, the head of Blue Book, narrates that that whole deal about they're in the room and, and the alien says, they say, we want some proof. And the alien says, what do you want? And they say, uh, we want you to show yourself. And they say, go to the window. And they go to the window and this, this flying saucer in the daylight. And this is Robert Friend, the head of Blue Book's telling this story. The thing goes flying by over top of the Capitol and they all look at, and the radar is blocked out at that time. They can't get the, the radar signature. And, and that's the whole thing. So yeah, there does seem to be this communication thing where they, they leak these two stories that yeah, they do have this uh, communication thing. And there's one I really can't talk about. There's one of these things where the guy told me and then told me not to keep it. But it appears now uh, an agency that would surprise everybody, but it makes sense. I explained to the guy, got contacted about contact and they wanted your contact. We want to see if we get the, give me your messages. We want to see if we get the same messages. This is, this is a, and this is a, coming from a government email. This is not coming from some guy's private email. This is coming from an official inside the U.S. government. And that was the whole deal: is they want to see if the signals are the same as if they're doing this this communication stuff. And that that's what you want. That's what the whole Skinwalker thing was about. Everybody said, "Oh, Skinwalker is about UFOs," and it's baloney. It was about UFOs. That that was a that was a thing where they they worked it in there. But the, the whole Skinwalker thing, Jacques Vallée talked about it in his in his diary. At the end of 96, 97, he said, what are you doing here? There's no UFO. It's like, we're wasting our time. What are you supposed to be doing here? And it was the whole weird thing. It was the Apport thing. And I put it in my Apport book where I talk about the 1974 DIA document that says, oh, we, this Apport thing is very important, putting stuff through solid surfaces. If we could learn to do this apportation thing, we could actually go to the enemy, go into the vault, take the documents, go back to Washington, photocopy the documents, and put them back, and they would not even know we were there. That's why they went to Skinwalker. How do you put four bulls inside a trailer that's locked? That's what they were trying to figure out. How, and the portal. The, the portal was the big story they were after. Because I maintain, I, I've looked at, I've done this for years and years and years. And every time I go after anti-gravity, it doesn't go anywhere. Every time I go after portals, it goes somewhere. I think they understand about portals. They have some sort of portal. That's I told that story about uh, Tim Taylor at the at the cottage in in um, hmm. um, in Pennsylvania. And this is the top guy. I mean, in, in you know one of the top guys in the UFO black world. And he's he's showing me these photographs. He says, you know, I don't know if I told you the story, but these two guys flying through space on a on a painting. And he says, what do you think of this? And that and I've heard other people. The way he does it he doesn't really tell you he just says what do you think about this so i go i don't know it's like i'm looking at it i don't know and he goes shows the next one and it's all these balls and it's in a in a for in a painting all these balls are going in into the middle and they're getting down like going down a tunnel and so what do you think of this and i go and and then he shows me this three three uh paintings of this uh eclipse i, go, I don't know and then he shows me the side of a wall outside a building and this and there's these uh space scenes on on this screen on this, and so what do you guess? I don't, Tim, I have no idea what you're showing me here. And then he shows me this car on top of the parkade between these two buildings. And he says, so you know, you know what? You see the in the back there, and you can see this thing in the back seat. He says it's a postcard. You know what the postcard says? And then I says, no, what's it say? And he, I can't remember it exactly. It was something because I didn't pay attention at the time. He said, oh, it's about uh, some guy with his girlfriend. And he said, I wish you could travel through time and space to be with you. And I go, really? That's what it says. And and then he, and then he says, he he. he I'm, I still don't know. And then he says, so you know where this is? And I go, no, I don't know where it is. And he said, it's, it's Hughes aircraft in Los Angeles outside of LAX. And I go, Tim, I still don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. And he said, you know what was there? And I said, well, I don't know if he said, do you know what was there? Do you know what was rumored to be there? I don't see. I don't remember the exact conversation. If I had known who the guy was, I didn't know who the guy was. If I had time, known, I would have yeah. paid close attention to what he was saying. 
but it was basically, you know, what's there or what was rumored to be there. And I said, no, what? He said, the jump room. And I said, really? That's where the jump room was? The CIA, the Obama going to Mars and all that stuff. And I go, really? And he said, you know where the one with the guy, two guys flying through space, you know where that is? I said, no, where's that? He said, right outside the elevator. And I, and it was took me like two or three years. And I was sitting there and all of a sudden I, it occurs to me, it's like, why the hell did Tim show me those photographs? Like, what was that about? And it's like, why would this guy have these photographs on his phone unless he had gone there? And he even told me, he said, well, I said, well, I'm going there. I'm going to go film this. I, next time I'm at LAX, I'm going to, and I did. I got off the plane. I got on a bus and over at the 999 Sepulveda Avenue is where it is. There's two buildings there. And I, I went there and he said, watch out for the guard. There's a guard there that's uh, on, on that main part. And uh, so I went there and the guard was letting people in. And I'm sitting there and I'm photographing exactly what Tim had shown me. And that was the whole deal. It was like uh, you, you get these little, uh, these little clues. But um, I forgot what your question was, where, where we were going with this. Oh, well, I, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that was a, you went on quite a thing because I was talking about the David Grush and the possible agreements, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's the thing is, yeah, they're, they do this, this contact thing. I mean, they would be, they'd be crazy not to do it. They're trying to have these signals. That's what, like, with Chris Bledsoe, what did they say to Chris Bledsoe? They said, Chris said, hey, what are you doing on my property? Oh, you military people are scaring my kids. They're, they're terrorized by what's going on here. And then Tim says to him, he says, well, Chris, he says, it, it appears that um, they they like you and uh, they, they're they contacting you. They don't like us, Chris. They don't talk to us. So we're here to find out what are they telling you? And that's, there was a, a thing that I went, actually went back to Dan Smith. I said, because I, I lost track of it. I had it written down. And then I, it was like a poem. And I went back to Dan and I said, hey, did Ron write this? And he comes back and he goes, maybe. <laughs> and it says, because we cannot control the phenomena, we have to watch those that the phenomena interacts with or affects or something like that effect. And that, and it, go, it goes on a little bit more. But that was the whole idea is, it, where does the CIA get their intelligence? It gets it from the experiencers. I remember talking to Betty Andreas and when, when she's, her husband was all upset. Oh, they're getting into my computer and they're monitoring and I'm furious and I've filed FOAs and they're going to get onto my computer. They're, they're intercepting my communications or whatever. I said, hey, uh, Bob, he said, did your wife get uh, drawings and stuff? Didn't she get drawings of the craft and the propulsion system? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he starts talking. And I said, well, are you surprised they're in your computer? Of course, they're going to try to figure out what, that's the thing. The experiencers know. And, and so they, that's when they, they talk to the experiencers. They're trying to figure out what's going on either. People have the idea, and I think it's an illusion, that there's going to be a disclosure, that the government knows exactly what's going on. There may be one or two people who have a little bit more information. But basically, I think it's going to be like every other thing in nature. That the more you look at it, the more complex it gets. It's like uh, it's like we, we're saying, oh, they're 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 explaining stuff. They're not. They're describing stuff. They're describing. They've got a craft, like in the Wilson Leak document. They're describing a craft. We have a craft, and we think it'll fly. Now, when I saw that, I knew the story about the craft, and they had this craft, and they couldn't turn the thing on and stuff like that. And then I got all the people started telling me about flying the craft that you need a consciousness interface to fly the craft. So when I saw the whole thing, we've got a craft, and we think it'll fly. I go, that story's true. They've got a craft and they can't turn it on. They can't, they've got, they don't have a consciousness interface. And uh, so uh, in, in all this stuff, they, you would see that they would be, they would be trying to do it, but the disclosure stuff will just be that it's, a, and they know a little bit more than we do. And it's almost like Moses goes to the Red Sea. Moses takes a staff and he opens the water and, and the, 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 the land gets all dry and the wind comes up and the children of Israel run through. And then he puts the rod down and, and the, the water goes back together. And it's like, fantastic story now how do you do the trick and that's the whole thing we can describe what's happening with ufos the colors and the, the different things that are happening but in terms of explaining i'm i'm pretty sure they really don't know and you could just go to the ukraine war and you see in the ukraine war this is world war one trench warfare where the hell is the secret technology where is afghanistan who lost the war against a bunch of guys on camels and donkeys and they lost that war where's the secret technology it's, it's all, to me, it's all military bravado. I think that is Jim Semivan says, Jim Semivan said, oh, uh, people say all we've got to do is, is, is connect the dots together. I'm not sure there's any dots to connect. And he's got the briefing. And, and he said that's the same thing. He said, Who, who's running the show? John Alexander, when John, when he told John, it's for real, John. And John really didn't want to believe it. He said, okay, so who's running the show? And he said, they are. And this is the whole deal. They're doing ones doing disclosure. They're doing this little drop breadcrumb thing. They're moving us down. They're getting curiosity because that's the way you work it. Or as Mike Clellan said, 
Mike Clawlin writes the book on on the on the um, on the owls, and now he says I'm his spokesman for this story. It's a very important story. He says he gets regressed by Avon Smith. He's he's sleeping in in the Utah desert, and then he suddenly he's out of his body and he's above this craft, and he goes in the craft and he puts on the the gray suit, and suddenly he's a gray and he's looking at himself, and he goes into this room, and the and the beings have this. He said it looks like a hotel room in in Indiana with fake carpet and wooden tables. And it's like, it's just like, oh my goodness. And these beings, you can't see their faces. And he said, it's time. And he says, what do you mean time? Time for what? And then, and they say, it's time. And then suddenly he realizes, oh, I volunteered for this. And he starts swearing at me. He's all upset. And he, he says, you know, this is, I didn't you tell me it was going to be this hard. You didn't tell me it'd be this lonely. And he's yelling and screaming at these beings. And then they sort of talk, calm him down. He's like a pin going into a balloon, just whoo, calm him down. And that's when Yvonne Smith says, he had asked before the regression started, he said, when I get under, ask me about the owls. Why am I so obsessed with owls? What's what's the deal? So then he calms down, silence, and then Yvonne says, so Mike, what's with the owls? Why are you interested in owls? And he starts channeling. He starts channeling. He goes, the owls are not important. The owls don't mean anything. The owls are just a symbol. The owls are a symbol that you put on a door. It's the door that's important. You're in a hallway and you see the, the symbol on the door. And then you open the door and you see a vast unexplored universe. And that's what the UFO is. That's what the owl is. That's what all this stuff, it's a symbol that's on the door and it gets you curious. And you, when you have an experience, you go, what the heck happened to me? And then you go, you, you start investigating and you open the door and then and it takes you to another door and another door. And all they're doing is taking us from door to door to door. But I don't think anybody has the answers. And we have this idea, almost like, um, you know, that the government is this uh, uh, powerful thing that has all these answers or that there's some sort of Illuminati that, that understands everything. I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that there there may be a few people who I understand, but that's where Tim Taylor uh, basically uh, said, you know, we've come to you to get the answers. They're not talking to us and, and we really don't know. So they know, I, I would maintain that one of the things they do know is the portals. Every time I go after portals, there's something at the end of the story. There's there's something, even Ron, the, the one time I caught the, the camera where he put the thing on the film, the mo one of the most important videos ever taken. He was furious when I when I posted it, or Bruce McAbee showed it to him. And that's he's sitting on a on a cruise ship going through the Panama Canal. And 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 they're just talking and there's lots of noise and stuff. And and Kevin Alber, who's one of the guys that went to Chris Bledsoe's place and you know threatened him or whatever, uh, he's filming. And then uh, Aaliyah, the, uh, Ron's wife, says, so footman, what do you say? And then Ron says this, apps, it, there's no other way to phrase it. He says, people have always wondered to what it's like to go into the next world. The next time John, and he looks over at this John Sillison guy, cleaning his glasses, sitting beside him. He went to university with him in California. He says, next time John goes to the desert, and there's always a story, these poor little things are in the desert. Next time he goes to the desert, a number of us here are going to go into the next world and come back again. That's end of story. I mean, they understand there's something to that. That is Ron, who's everybody says he's a disinformation guy. He wasn't disinforming anybody. He was just they were having a conversation with his wife. And and every time I go, especially around Ron, that portal story uh, always comes out. Even I posted, I, I, we talked before the show where I had this thing where I was looking for a quote from Ron. Ron's got some really good quotes. I'm looking for this quote for this new book on uh, crossovers that I'm doing. And I'm looking for this quote and I find a, a, a quote by Ron. I put it on Twitter and I'm still looking and I find another, oh, this is a good one. I put on, and I, and I end up with about 15 of his quotes. I just put them on, on, on Twitter. Mm. And one of them was some guy writing him a letter and he's writing back to him. And he says, oh, by the way, my wife has a kind of a time machine, a, a kind of a time machine. And uh, so your thought is right or something like that. It's a camera it was. And that's the whole deal. When you see him making this thing, like this time machine that she uh, has control of this thing and that they're they're opening these portals and that they understand. And that may be what the whole, his whole thing about Hal put off and Kit Green and all this stuff is. And I think the more I listen to it, the more I realize this may be true. And this is this idea that he said, starting in 1991, loons, crooks, and worse. And he, uh, he basically, what he is basically seems to be saying to me is if you're talking anti-gravity stuff and stuff, you're either a loon, a crook, or worse. And because there isn't that, that's all garbage. That, that, that's not going anywhere. Because he's talking about the portal thing. And so uh you you have this thing where he says, you know, they're 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 just trying to get money. They ran out of billionaires. He said they went after billionaires to start with. And then when they ran out of billionaires, then they went. And that's in my second Beyond Managing Magic book. That's where I talk about this whole idea of how they're selling this thing to Congress. And the big thing about 
Eisenhower saying, beware the military industrial congressional complex. And I say that all these programs are, are legal. They appear to be legal, that this has got these, these, uh, these uh, rules that have been written in there, how they got the crafts. Tom DeLong described how they got the crafts. And, and the, the, the whole idea is that they're trying to get funding for uh, all this stuff. And it doesn't go anywhere. If you look at the story, you probably know the story of Firmage. So Firmage it was helped put off and Kit Green. So these are the guys that are supposed to know everything. They're working with with Firmage on what was called the bouncing box. And yeah. You can go to the internet. You can find the video of the bouncing box, and you can see on the video, Hell Put Off's on the video, uh, Kit Green's on the video, and Brandon Fugel, who financed the whole thing, is on the video. And they're sitting there, and they got this this uh, thing attached to this bouncing box. These gyros are counter rotating, and they're going really fast. And this box is bouncing, but it does not get off the off the table. And and they're they're weighing it and they're trying to see is there a a, re a a reduction of gravity which is exactly the same thing the Canadians were doing back in 1950 they were doing exactly the same experiment but they they had it and so the idea is if they couldn't levitate this thing one inch off the table what's the chances that help put off and air and that all these guys have this super technology and we're flying to star systems and stuff to me there's no chance whatsoever if you can't get that thing off the table and all these are guys are there so it's the idea that we're, we we want money to put in it and that's what I I say. Is that people are are they blaming Lockheed Skunk Works? I say keep in mind Lockheed Skunk Works went to Tom DeLong. Lockheed Skunk Works, Robert Weiss that ran Lockheed Skunk Works was in a disclosure meeting with John Podesta, and he actually came back later and said, "Has John got any updates that that he might be able to give me and stuff like that?" Right, they were behind this, and what it may be that you're trying to put it out the front door and bring it back in the back door because they can't figure the thing out, which is my basic premise. Is that this thing is so much more complex, or as 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 uh, Lekatsky said, and he's a guy that ran the program. What Lekatsky said: if you knew that, you would realize that the rest of the book was totally primitive. That it's way more complex than people think it is, and there is no simple answer. And that's what they're selling Congress. They're saying, "Oh, we've got one more piece to put the puzzle," and or Lockheed's got it, and Lockheed's breaking the law. And I and I keep posting, and nobody nobody replies. I say, "Where did they get the crafts?" If they're breaking the law, how did they get the crafts? Somebody gave them the crafts from the government and they would have written up in rules. If you listen to Jim Semivan, Jim Semivan said, I couldn't do a thing. Every time I turned around, there was a lawyer to look at what I'm doing. And if you listen to what Jim Lekatsky said, what did he say? He said, I know I saw no illegality, but I saw very high security procedures. And that's what the Canadians said in 1950. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. And you have levels, you have all this fear. $886 billion defense budget, big weapons, bigger planes, bigger this, whatever, and more and more security, level, more and more levels of security, getting deeper and deeper and deeper. If you remember the story about Bob Lazar at Area 51, one of the stories people ignore or forget is this fact they were issued him a gun, that the Russians were trying to kidnap people, at supposedly according to EG&G &G from the UFO program, and they gave him a gun to protect himself. And you you see these stories that, that we, we may have something but in terms of this whole thing, it's a, sale, a sales job to the to the Congress. And that even if you say it was illegal and you you sort of defy the thing with Project Moondust, which was the whole State Department uh, thing where anything that lands on American territory belongs to NASA and they do the analysis and this sort of thing. Uh, here you you have um, a, a situation where uh, the, the the laws were were written up. And even if you say it was illegal, it's now legal because the way it works, I'm not Canadian, but I think I know how the, a little bit of how the Americans write up laws. It was signed by the House. It was signed by the Senate and it was signed by the by the by the by the White House, which means it's law. That's the law. And the law says, no, you don't have to report to a to a panel. You do not have to report to uh, what you've got. You do not have to do all this kind of stuff. It is now that's now the law that they don't have to do this kind of stuff. And, and what we've done is we sort of demonized um them and uh i i think that there there are laws and there's regulations that that have protected this and definitely it is law now if, if it if it wasn't law before and and everybody that's at a high level i think will say that that there is this extreme um classification behind this program uh because they haven't got it figured out and you're not going to put your cards on the table and you're not going to expose the crafts where the crafts are or where you put the post post the, uh, the the email addresses and the phone numbers and the addresses of all the people working on the crafts. I mean, we're going to expose people to this stuff. They, they, they just say, and that's what uh, Biden said in his in his reply. He said, there is stuff that is highly 
classified. And I'm the president, I'm responsible for classified material. So you have this whole thing. And 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 that the, the fact was that they, the, the people make it into this big conspiracy theory. And in fact, if the Democrats had won six more seats in the House, this thing would have gone through without a single word change. The only reason it didn't go through was because the Republicans had the control of the of the uh, uh, the armed services and the intelligence, and they got the the head of the uh, the, the the spokesman for uh, the, the the head guy in 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 the House. They got him on board. But if if they had had six more seats, the Democrats, they would have told Turner, "Sit down and shut up, mind your own business. We're running the show here." It's because they had the power to stop it. And so, it, it, what to me, it wasn't a conspiracy. It was just basically something that in Washington now you can block anything you want. One guy can get the Speaker of the House kicked out. You can block Ukrainian aid. I mean, you have an awful, awful lot of power in how the procedures work. So I don't I don't think there's the, the cover up that people think there is. Uh, I think that they all believe they're saving the world, that this is how they compartmentalize. And as Eric Walker said to us, and he confronted us, and I've posted this maybe 15 times in the last couple of years, nobody's ever answered it. And Walker said, why should admit it? You are just curious. That's the only reason you want to know about this disclosure thing, what's going on. Why should we change the rules and regulations to satisfy your curiosity? And then he said, the other thing which I posted, nobody's ever replied is, so when you get the answer, when you find out this is whatever extraterrestrial, interdimensional, whatever, what are you going to do then? And I can guarantee you, nobody's going to do a damn thing because everybody's just going to be on to the next message, next Facebook message. What's the next thing? And they just move on that the people don't. And the support of that is when when uh, Turner, the guy who was uh, uh, Michael Harbaugh is running against Turner. I found out and I did the interview with him. And he, as far as I know, he didn't get any funding from the UFO people. And he's running. He had a demonstration for UAP disclosure in front of Turner's office. And the first day there were six people showed up. The second day there were two people showed up, which again shows this idea that is curiosity. The UFO community just wants something to tweet about. They want a, the next story. And and it's, as I said, it's six miles wide and about half an inch deep, the support for this kind of stuff. That when it comes right down to it, the UFO people aren't going to really do anything. It's just curiosity. And that's what Walker said to us. And he may have been right that uh, they just say, uh, we're working on this. Uh, it's uh, We realize whoever runs this runs the world. And we don't care if you're curious. Get lost. Go as we said to us, go study something else. You're wasting your time. You're never going to get the answer. He said, go study something else. Unless you have the mind of Einstein, you're never going to understand that, which again confirms this idea that it's way more complex than people think it is, especially if my book is right with 36 people flying the craft that you can instantly go from here to the other side of the solar system like that. It's inside you. They say inside you, imagine it inside your mind and boom, they're on the other side of the solar system. Anybody says we got that, there was no way we got that kind of technology. Not a chance. Yeah. And um, I, I wanted to segue a little into something you've discussed before. It's called um, the theory of wow and yeah. how, how that re relates to the UFO phenomenon. Yeah, well, what I would say is is what Jim uh, Jim Semivan said. They are running the show. They're doing disclosure. They're, they're unraveling this thing. And the way they unravel it is by doing weird things because curiosity is what drives science. If you're not curious, you're not going to do any research. So what they do is these weird things that dry, drag individuals down and, and people down, uh, like Lekatsky. So Lekatsky goes to the to the ranch. He gets permission to go on the ranch. And he's only there for 45 minutes. And this thing appears above this guy's head in the kitchen. And he's looking at this thing. He's going, holy cow. And it's, I could just hear the, the, the object saying to Lekatsky, welcome, Dr. Lekatsky. We thought you'd never show up. And, and it's like they give him the show and he's down the rabbit hole and he goes to everybody and he sells the program and then they, they they bring the program back. And then what happens with the program? If it's illegal, what did Reed do? Reed got the program and started to run in 2009. What did Reed do? He wrote a letter to try to hide the OSAP program in a, a waived, unacknowledged special access program with a bigot list doing the same thing. Exactly the same thing. So would you break in the law? No, he's, they're trying to protect it. They're trying to protect it from the crazy religious people and the Pentagon people are trying to steal the budget, whatever. And so the theory of wow basically says they do these weird things that 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 force you to think about things. And the more you investigate, it's like the this the symbol of the owl on the door. It gets you to go to the door and then you go, hey, I wonder what and the door and you open the door. And 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 you get these these wild things. And the one that Lekatsky talked about in this interview, which I say is the probably the best interview I've heard in 10 years that Lekatsky did. And he said, let me drop you a thing here. The man in black are real. 
And then they go in and they start, well, the government and stuff, and here's the conspiracies. The government, no, 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 they, 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 they got that, but no, they're, they're real. They are real. Like they're UFO, black people, uh, people are real. And then he said, but they're using reverse psychology. They're not trying to threaten you to stay out of the program. They're trying to drag you in. That's the theory of, wow, someone shows up at your door, a woman with a wig, she's got it on sideways, she's got her, her tag, and she looks kind of weird, she's got old clothes on, she wants to do a, a survey or something, and you're going, this is weird, what is she, who is this woman, what's going on? And that's what they do, they use this weird stuff to drag you in, and then you start to explore it, and then they dra drop another little thing, weird thing, and that, that's what they're doing. So if you were on a, on a foreign planet, if you were to say, okay, we, we've got this critical situation in the world, where we've got to change the zeitgeist. We've got to move the zeitgeist from me versus you, individuals, everybody for themselves, into a, one, a, a, a world where everybody's taking care of each other and, and oneness is the message that we want to do. What are we going to do? And so the young grade one kid says, hey, I know what we'll do. We, we should have some crafts. We put some lights on them and we fly the crafts around. And, and that answers the question, why do you always have lights on them? They have lights on them so you can see them. They don't need, we don't have lights on our crafts. They don't need lights on the craft. And why, why do they do the, 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 the cat emulation? They're sending the, the message. They do this weird thing. And I even said to Linda, I said, Linda, why, why do they take all the blood out of the cow? And she's, well, you know, she, and I said, Linda, the reason they do that is because it's so weird. If it, they didn't take all the, the last drop of blood out of the cow, nobody would investigate it. They just go, how did they get the blood out of the cow? Just, and it just drags you into it and you start investigating. And then later on, you find out if, if, uh, Perkins is right. The guy had the biggest collection of, of cattle emulations. You realize they're all downwind and downstream for nuclear power activities. And, and there's this connection. And that when Fukushima happened, then about a couple of weeks later, you started getting cattle emulations in Oregon, which had never happened before. And, and you start getting these things. And, 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 and why, why do you make crop circles? Like nobody, and every paranormal phenomenon is the same. People say, we're, we're going to get the answer. We're going to get disclosure. There is no answer to anything. I don't care what it is. You take every paranormal phenomenon going back to 1848 with, with the Fox sisters, with the wrapping, where the whole spiritualism thing started in 1848. What paranormal phenomenon have we ever explained and said, oh, we can do this now. Uh, here, here's the method. Here's how you do it. We haven't explained anything. It's all paranormal. It's all ends with the, the whole thing where, like my friend, uh, had um, the guy that was cured by the, by the blue orb. Um, I asked him one time, I said, hey, J Jim, did you ever have your clothes turned inside out and backwards? And he said, yeah, twice. You want to see a photograph? And he shows me this photograph and he's got the shirt inside out and backwards. And then it had this orange stain on it. And so, of course, he sends it to Kathy Martin at MUFON and they do an analysis. And what's the analysis? It's exactly the same as every other analysis that they do. It's like, boy, that was weird. We don't know what's going on. It was weird. Same as the metamaterials. And people have this thing about the metamaterials, dropping pieces of metal and stuff like this. And I'm going, come on. I even said the hell, come on. This is, they're dropping this stuff. There's no way. Every single piece is different. The same as every UFO sighting is different, which Sarkowski said. Every alien is different. Every piece of metal is different. And they're just dropping this stuff. And it's to get you curious. It's even like the, the one with the Uba Tuba piece that, that I was laughing when Nolan put it out. It was like the same crash. And it's got two pieces of material. One, the isotopes are all messed up. And the other one, the ice the isotopes aren't messed up and you can just see the the intelligence going just laughing going, look look at the look on his face holy cow it's, and the, what they're doing is they're dragging you down this thing like what's going on the world and the bottom line is the world is not the way you think it is it is not a material world in fact if you take this you get to the far end of this thing it may be what deepak Chopra said everything is an activity inside consciousness when you have a near-death experience and you float out of your body and you look back and you see your body there, your body is inside your consciousness. You look out the window, it floating around the room, you look out the window and you see the universe, the universe is inside your consciousness. It's this whole idea that we've got everything wrong and what they're telling you, I call it shattering naive reality. We believed until 1920, the big debate with Shapley and Curtis, the big debate uh, about galaxies and Shapley at Harvard Observatory, this heavy, uh, top guy said, there's only one galaxy. And he was arguing his own one galaxy. And Curtis said, no, there's more than one galaxy. There's all these galaxies. And we're at the center of this galaxy. And we have to realize that we've got a lot of stuff wrong. And that's what they're telling you. If the world worked the way you thought it was, it was just a material, random, meaningless universe, this stuff wouldn't be happening. But because this stuff is happening, every people will start to look at like Gary Nolan. Gary Nolan says, I'm not, inter I'm not interested in the 95 that fall inside the curve. I'm interested in the 5% that fall outside the curve. And when someone does a dissertation, he said, hey, why is that outside the curve there? Why? And explain that. And that's the thing is you look at the anomalies and it's the anomalies that will tell you something's wrong with your worldview. And, and that moves you on and you start to analyze and you move ahead. 
But the way we are now is is we want to compartmentalize it and just sort of believe that th this stuff is 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 made up. That's what they're doing. They're shattering naive reality with these very bizarre things. That's all they're doing. They're getting you to think. They're getting you to to move this thing down the road, open doors, and 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 explore. And uh, you know, in regards to that, you, you know, you mentioned that you have a book coming out called "Landing the Plane." Yeah, well, that's that's the uh, third managing magic book, which is the 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 idea that they gave me that they're running disclosure. It came as clear as day. It was the idea like quit getting so upset. You know, you're you're over dramatizing this. Don't worry, we know how to land the plane. And as soon as I got that, I knew exactly what they're talking about. Is we're running the show, and we they may have done it like I always said, like if if people like people believe there's extraterrestrials, so I say okay, 1896, the year we discovered radioactivity. Uh, the, these things that were there and the, the St. Louis Dispatch and the Washington Examiner all said these are from Mars. So were they actually from Mars? Were they actually these wooden ships with big, huge lights on them when we didn't have batteries till about five or six years later? Did, did, did these wooden ships fly from Mars? And you go, no, it's, it's the idea that they're, they're representing. And then suddenly you get the, the, the Foo Fighters, which is only about a year. The Foo Fighters were there. And then you have the, the rockets that were in the swamps, which are still going into the swamps in Sweden, these rocket ships flying across there. And then you have the green fireballs. Then you have the Adamski crafts. And then you have the crafts with windows. There's no crafts with windows anymore. Now it's all orbs. And it's, they're doing this, and then they're doing this, and they're doing this. And the, the, whole, the whole point of the thing is that the phenomena is able to morph according to our belief system. And Kit Green has said that. Mac has said that. And it's, it's moving us moving us along but the idea that we we've done this before we we know how to land the plane don't worry we know what we're doing here and and the the idea is that they have done this on maybe a thousand different planets they know exactly how to change so we, we say where are the foo fighters well they're on another planet that's 100 years behind us and as soon as the foo fighters get finished there then they're going to send in the green fireballs then they're going to send in the adamski craft and they do the same routine all the time they know how to move us down the road because the way we do it is we go into a country and we say we're here to bring you freedom democracy jesus and mcdonald's and then these point guns <laughs> they get the hell out of our country they don't do that they're doing they're not landing they're doing this indirect thing where they're forcing us to do the analysis they're forcing us to come to the answer they're not going to drop in and and uh you know like santa claus and hand out toys people always confuse you ufos and santa claus they have this idea that you know we deserve this and and we want this and it's like i want limited government but here's my 10 page list of stuff i want the government to do for me and we want this we want that and demanding this and demanding that and we're like the little kid in the candy bar with he wants a candy bar he's in the, in the shopping cart and he's screaming and yelling because he can't get a candy bar where you know it's it and that's what walker came down to admit it you're just curious that's all it is you're curious why should we change the rules and regulations and when he said that rules and regulations that's immediately i said hey there's rules and regulations. So when people say now there's no rules and regulations, this is a rogue gr group that's gone crazy and it's all illegal, whatever. I think back to Walker said, 1990, he said, why should we change the rules and regulations? And he ran the the, the top mil. He was chairman of the board of the top military think tank, 14 honorary doctorate degrees, was friends with Vannevar Bush. When Vannevar Bush left the Pentagon, he got his office. He uh, knew all the presidents. He was a very, very powerful guy. And then when he said there's rules and regulations, I went, Hey, there's rules and regulations to this. And, and that is what I believe it is. It's very compartmentalized. It's very secret. Almost like the, 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 the bigger the defense budget gets, I can almost guarantee you there's going to be new levels of security even now. They're going to dig it even deeper and deeper and deeper now that it's starting to leak. They're going to put it below. And they've actually got authorization now from the House, the Senate, and the White House that this is legal. That's, that they've, they've been told, that keep doing what you're doing. And the only thing that'll change it is if the Democrats can control the House and the Senate, then disclosure is going to go through. There's no conspiracy. There's no evil stuff or whatever. It was just a matter of numbers inside the political system that you have. And, you know, in regards to, um, you know, the, the theory of wow and um, and the, the landing the plane idea, uh, you know, the UFO phenomenon is obviously some kind of super advanced intelligence. So what, what what do you think is responsible for the UFO phenomenon then? What do you what do you think the source of of all this is? Well that that's where I go to the whole thing that I keep saying like Jacques Vallée. Nah, this is going to be ET. This is going to be something here now always here. It's going to turn out to be I would say it's going to be consciousness or it's going to be spirituality. It's going to be a spiritual type thing that Chris Basso says. And that's why I'm doing this crossover book. Right? I think it's so important. For example, 
people don't realize to get into these little compartments, specialized, compartmentalized, and they think this is where all the answers are, and they don't realize this stuff's happening all over the place. So let me give you an example. Ron Johnson is one of the guys that threw the crap. He's a Utah Mormon guy. He's had experience his whole life. He documented. He's got a stack of stuff like this. Documented his whole life, all these experiences. Out-of-body experiences, uh, stuff. The being, and, and another thing that I realized, there's this pattern that usually everybody has one being that talks to them. Remember I talked to you about Jim Semivan when Jim Semivan said, hey, there was this, uh, this being behind me and it had this guardian type thing going on about it. And I go, shit, he's talking spirit guy. This is a spirit guy. What side? He's on right and left side. And Chris Bledsoe said the same thing. And then when I asked Whitley Strieber, I said, Whitley, you ever have anybody behind you on the craft that uh, is talking to you and telling you what to do, but you, you're not allowed to look or you can't see them? He said, all the time. He said, when I was going to steal the craft, I was sitting at the panel. I thought, oh, I'm going to steal this craft. And he said, you could hear this voice behind him laughing. And 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 so the, what, what we get is this, um, I lost my train of thought. We, um, we, we get, oh no, Chris, so, Ron Johnson has experience. So he's dealing with one being. Being's name is Elby. And he's always had this for 20 years. He's had this Elby. So Elby takes him in the spirit world three times. So is this spirit world or is this aliens? Takes him in the spirit world. First time he's in like a sort of a dark sort of thing. He can sort of sense something's going on. Second time he's there. He, can, he can't see his mother, but his, his dead mother. He's talking to his dead mother. The third one, he's in the spirit world. And he's in this field. And his mother's there. And she says, Ron, when you die, and he says, there's this building there, as real as 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 real as can be. It's the building sitting there. It looks like a, a small Mormon temple, little tiny Mormon temple. And she says, Ron, when you die, you're going to get a room inside this building. And so they go to the walking to this building. And then the thing opens up. She says, your father's got a room. The thing opens up like a portal. And he can see his father inside this building. And he says, so I go inside the building. And he says, it was like a. Ten or hundred times the size inside is outside. I go, hey, that's what the UFO people say. That's what the, the, the whistleblower that that uh, uh, Danny Sheehan just referred to. The guy goes inside the craft. It's the size of a football stadium inside. He becomes disoriented and he leaves the craft. And he thinks he's in there for two minutes. And he's gone for four hours and stuff like that. And and this is the thing. So I'm going, hey, is he in a Mormon temple in the spirit world or is he in a UFO? And you start to realize there's these crossovers and there's hundreds of crossovers on all sorts of different things. That's what this book is about. And it was like driven. I've been driven to write this book. And 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 so he goes inside this building and then his mother's showing him there's stuff inside the building. And then he says, and then we go down to the far end of the of the building and here's the tables, these tables. And there's these crystals coming out of the table. And I said, crystals coming out of the table? And he said, yeah. And he says, and, and you look at these crystals at a certain angle and he says, and you can you can see your your past lives. You can you can see everything. You can see what happened. And he said, I saw it. My and my mother said to me, she says, Ron, you don't have a crystal coming out of the table yet because you're not dead. As soon as you you die, there'll be a crystal that come out of the table. And and then he says, I saw my dog's crystal. And he said, 1972, my dog disappeared. And he said, I never knew what happened to my dog. So he says, I looked in the crystal at the angle, and he's watching. And he said, the neighbor came and shot the dog, threw him in the back of a of a pickup truck, took him to the dump, and threw him in the dump. And and so then I was thinking to myself, hey, that's Richard Doty. That's UFO pass no UFO cover up live. Where Richard Doty has this thing. He said the most amazing thing I saw in the entire thing was this alien, and they showed the alien holding the crystal, and they could go back and they could look through history and they could show you the crucifixion of Jesus on this crystal. And this is saying, I go, hey, that's the same story. It's like these stories are being repeated, and you start to realize that these things are all connected. The spirit world is connected to this thing. Or you take a look at when I had the people flying the craft. It was the whole idea where where the, they would say, it's within you. Go within yourself, and when you do, push the button. And everybody did something different. It's like UFO sightings. Everybody had the same thing. The craft was alive. The craft was conscious. They would touch the craft. They would become one with the craft. Whatever the craft thought was what what they would do, and they could go instantaneously anywhere in the universe they wanted. But they would say, "You, you but everybody touched something different." Like Chris Blesso touched a, a beehive in the middle of the, the the room. Somebody touched a panel. The U.S. Air Force retired colonel touched these panels. Somebody pushed a button. It was always different things, but it was the same principle. And and so uh, they they would they would be able to to go wherever they wanted, and. Um, we, you 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 see you see that that pattern of consciousness that you go and so you have it, it's like a remote viewer you say okay here's the number six seven four three two one and then the guy goes 
okay, I'm at the target. It's not like, hey, I'm flying to the target. I'll be there in a minute. You know, like it's like instantaneous. And it's the whole concept of the mystical training. It's all within you. John Wheeler, there is no out there, out there. It's a participatory universe. Everything is, is the idea. And so the people in, inside the craft would say, I touched the panel and suddenly I could see in 360 degrees. I went, hey, that's out of body experience people. That's what they say. I could see. In and these are the kind of things like if you're going to make up a story about being on a craft. You're not going to make up the story. Hey, I flew the craft. I remember the woman, the first woman told me she was in her 70s. And she told me to flew the craft. I'm like, oh, God, like, come on. I mean, it's like, get out of here. Like, I was thinking to myself, oh, you're 70 years old. And, you, you know, women in Saudi Arabia can't drive a car unless their husband's in the car or whatever. And you, you tell me you flew the craft. Yeah, yeah, I flew on three different models. And that was the whole thing. You're not going to make that story. You're not going to say I could see on 360 degrees. And you see these similarities where people saying these and you're going like, oh, that's, that's the out-of-body experience. And that's what you see, time and space. People inside the craft say there's no time and space in uh, lucid dreaming. There's there's the time and space disappear. And then you start questioning this whole thing about shattered reality. Is there actually time and space? If there's no such thing as time and space, then how big is the universe? Maybe a singularity right here and now. That's all there is. And you start getting into this whole thing that the, it just gets more and more complex, the phenomena, whereas the, you, I think the vast majority of the UFO community believes that it, we've got it solved. There's one little piece, and that's the government's piece. We put that in and we're going to explain it all. That what I've seen and what this new book is going to show is that it's all over the place. Orbs are in mediums. They're in uh, UFOs or the, the blue orbs. Blue orbs say, oh, the evil blue orbs. And the blue orbs, I mean, I, there's just hundreds of stories of blue orbs. Betty Andreessen had a blue orb. It was her guardian. So, I mean, the evil blue orbs and she's got a guardian. Uh, the guy, this gym friend of mine, he was healed and he caught it on film as this thing went into his body, this blue thing. And then he goes to the doctor and he has this big uh, lymph node cancer, and then it's gone. And then the doctor says, "What happened to the cat? What happened?" He said, "Oh, I think it disappeared Saturday night." He said, "Doesn't just disappear." He said, "Yeah, I think it disappeared." And and this whole idea that you see orbs in every type of paranormal phenomenon, and you start wondering, are all the paranormal phenomena different? And all it is is a different movie theater. So whatever the intelligence is doing, it's doing a different thing. So it in one movie theater, it's doing uh, uh, for Arabs, it's doing their their thing with the jinn and all this kind of stuff. And it's the way you interpret it. And that's what John Mack had said. And that's what Kit Green said. Kit Green says, you can get two people at the same event who see two different beings. Or you take the Colm Kelleher story. Colm Kelleher tells that very important story. I think there's six people. They've got Gen 3 glasses, night vision go go uh, binoculars. The object comes over the, the ridge at Skinwalker Ranch. All these people, and I imagine they're government people, all are watching this thing and it flies by. At the end of the night, they compare notes. One saw a triangle, one saw a, a round circle. They all saw something different. And that's where things really start getting messy. If all UFO sightings are different, everything everything's off the table. I mean, why are we gathering and counting red ones and green ones and fast ones and slow ones and stuff like that? It's this morphing thing and it, it becomes this consciousness thing. So I'm going to say it's going to be a consciousness type thing that's interacting with us from wherever and it's almost like we're at the bottom of the water and if you have a near-death experience most most of those people become very psychic or 37 percent of all uh, experiencers have near-death experiences and what it is you're at the bottom of the water and you can suddenly dissociate and you you get taken on the craft you you, you get to see stuff uh, or the experience 30 uh, 40 percent of experiencers say at one point during your experience you knew the answer to everything in the universe same as as nick cook's wife had that experience in a shared near-death experience where she said, everything's perfect. I was in this field. I knew everything. I wasn't allowed to take it back. I've had that experience three times. So this is the whole the whole thing is that all the answers are there. And when you dissociate by being abducted, going through the front windshield of a car or having a fever or whatever, you dissociate and you can go into the field, get the material or you float up into the water. You're in the dark water, you float up. And the, the, the more you float, you get closer to the surface. You can see stuff and you see these fish and you go back and say, hey, I saw these fish. And they go, yeah, you're dreaming. You're imagining it all this kind of stuff, or Gary Nolan, where Gary Nolan knows this whole thing. I said to Gary, because I heard him t tell the story about how he would sit there and go through it, and then he'd put the piece of paper beside the bed, and he'd wake up in the morning, and either that day or the next day, the idea would come in his head. I said, can I get a quote? And he said, yeah, he, he described the same process. He said, I don't know how it works. I don't know if it's little elves in my head or whatever it is, but I know how to make it work. And that's where we're learning from this phenomena is we're learning there's this dissociation that there are different vibrations or level, not levels, because levels is nouns. I don't think there's any nouns. If you say it's a noun, there's levels, there's whatever. It's it's alive. It's, it, we're like a cell inside a human body. Everything's alive. Everything's moving. Everything's changing. The crafts are changing. The beings are changing. Everything's changing. And, and people have these stories. And that's why the experiences are the most important ones, 
And that's what Ron seemed to indicate is you're not going to learn anything from looking at lights in the sky. You have to talk to the people that are interacting with whatever this intelligence is. And uh, I have my doubts that it's going to be ET because people have asked him. Sherry Wilde said when when the, the, the publisher exposed the, the being, he said, he said he's from uh, from Andromeda. He said, yeah. He said he's a Zeta. Yeah, he's a Zeta. He said, well, he can't be from Andromeda. He's a Zeta. He's from Zeta Reticuli. Really? She says, she know you. really? And he said, yeah, go ask him. So then she, Sherry Wild says, hey, so are you actually an alien? And then Dawes says, no, that would not best describe who I actually am. I'm, a, I'm an etheric being on a mission in the cosmos for the creator. Or Yossi Ronan, if you ever interviewed him, he said he was told by the being in Los Angeles, he's an a Israeli experiencer. He said he was told, when we come to your world, we take on a body. We can take on whatever body we want to do the work. We don't need to take on a body. You don't either. You just don't realize it. And, and you, you get this sort of thing. Or where I talked to the beings in Great Britain, I said, first question, these beings, they don't have any faces, they don't have anything. And I said, hey, are you an extraterrestrial? And they said, would you like us to be an extraterrestrial? We could do that if you want. We could even take you to our planet. But no, we're not extraterrestrials. We've always been here. You're the visitor. And I went, holy shoot. And that's the thing. When you start out, and I, I experienced this, next time you see them, ask them, are you actually an alien? And you get these crazy replies where they'll say, are, are you, where are you from? And they'll say, you wouldn't understand. Well, if you're from a planet, what would I not understand? And they always play this game. You don't need to know that or on the map. Where are you on the map? I don't know. Well, then how can we tell you where we're from the map? And they play these little games about where they're from. And I think they're just, as the zeitgeist changes, as our as we evolve, the phenomena changes. And I've been in it long enough to know that in 1975, it was a totally different world than it is now. There was there was, there was was ground traces. There are no ground traces. I don't care what There has not been a ground trace for 25 years. The thing lands and it leaves the tripod and burns the grass and stuff like that. It doesn't happen anymore. And the crop circles only started in 82. And then they sort of faded out. And the cattle mutilations were going wild in the 1970s. And then they faded out. And you see this phenomenon is morphing. It's changing. And and that's what we have to realize. Is that that, it's, it, that is, exemplifies reality. What this phenomenon is teaching us is... How does reality actually work? And when you start looking at it, you realize it's not the physical world you really think it is. It has this conscious, strong consciousness component or even uh, Deepak Chopra. Everything is an activity inside consciousness or the, the uh, bore or whatever said. What you think is physical is not really physical. This a whole idea that we're, we're shifting. Quantum physics is changing and the, 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 the spooky action at a distance. All UFO people have that. It's like, boom, I was like, John Ramirez told me that. It's like, boom, it's like there. It's like right at the planet instantaneously. And if that's true, or Ron Johnson said, they said, where would you like to go, Ron? He said, I'd like to see the Milky Way from a distance. He said, okay, take one second, Ron. Sit in the chair. And he's sitting in his chair, holding on to this chair that he said was built for him. He's sitting in his chair and he said, boom. Suddenly he looked out and there's the Milky Way. That's like 50 to 70,000 light years in one second. If that's true, and Ron Johnson's telling the truth, if that's true, there's something wrong with our physics. And that's the whole thing. That's how you get the Nobel Prizes. And the Gary Nolan will tell you, the 5% that are outside the curve, that's where the Nobel Prizes come from, is to study this stuff, because it's going to give you something that people don't know. And all the money should be spent on this type of stuff, because it's showing us that what you think is not real. And they're doing it indirectly, rather than landing on the White House lawn and giving us a lecture. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're, we're running out of time here, Grant. Uh, I, could, I could talk to you all night, but... Um... Uh, for for people watching and listening, when it, when is uh, do you have a release date for these books? Um, right now they're on hold. I'm I've got um, I think I think the and plus I, I I now don't have an editor so and and somebody to put up. I got I got to edit it myself. I use artificial intelligence, which I'm not too impressed with. Uh, but I'm I'm holding them back because there's these controversies. I'll have to go over it and see. Because you know what it's like, it's very controversial as to who did what to who. And there was the fights over the, you know, with uh, John Greenwald and uh, there was Ron, Ron Pandolfi got sued. And some of these stories that are in the book are, I'm thinking to myself, is it really worth it? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of more interested in in the writing stuff. So there's no set date. They're, they're, they're finished and they're, they're edited. Uh, they just have to be uploaded. But uh uh, I'm not sure. And there's a book I have, uh, I also didn't release called The Gifts, where I look at weird synchronicities where materialism uh, was discovered in 1848 by uh, Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx, it was written in the Communist Manifesto, The Idea of Materialism. And that's when the same year that spiritualism started with the Fox sisters, 1848. So I look at these things and say, 
hey, are these coincidences where the universe is giving you two opposites to go against each other where we, we work through? So um, the, the one that I'm working on now, for sure, I, I will put out the, the, the crossovers. I think it's one of the most important books I've written. And that's just, it gets into the consciousness thing and it gets into a lot of stuff where you think something's happening in ufology and you realize it's happening, all these different phenomena. And it's, it looks like it's all the same intelligence uh, that is that is doing it for uh, educational reasons or that we're part of it, that we are part, that we may, you know, you've heard the story. We may be the aliens. That's my family. I'm actually agreed to this. I, we have a contract and stuff like that. And uh, the, so this new book gets into that, all that kind of stuff that the world is, is way more weird than people think it is. Yeah. Well, that's a good note to leave it on. Uh, I appreciate you coming on, Grant, and I uh, hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, sure. Okay, anytime. All right, take care.